and the maze procedure, Cox maze four, begins with the left atrium. There are a lot of people who focus only on doing a box lesion, meaning the posterior left atrium. And if you think about the box lesion and say, all right, where does that fit? It fits in paroxysmal AFib more than in non-paroxysmal AFib. So if you think of the box lesion in paroxysmal AFib, and you do a box like this, meaning you get the pulmonary vein separately. Maybe you're doing a cabbage on someone and you don't want to open the left atrium and you think, I'm just going to take the bipolar clamp, fire it on the right, fire it on the left, maybe four sets of two on each one, meaning multiple firings. How good is that for paroxysmal AFib? And the answer is about 60%. We think of the pulmonary veins as being the sites of the triggers for paroxysmal AFib, and they are the most important site of triggers for paroxysmal AFib, but they're not the whole thing. They're about 60%. So if you've got some cabbage patient and you say, I'm just going to use a bipolar clamp, guy's got paroxysmal AFib, but I'm just using the clamp, what can I expect? About 60%. Now, if you were to extend that and do a complete box lesion, meaning it's more than bilateral pulmonary vein isolation, then you get the entire back of the left atrium and you get really the whole box. You box out the posterior left atrium and that's gonna be worth about 80% of the triggers, which is not bad. And this can be done off pump, although it's uh, somewhat demanding to do. If you consider the box lesion and say, is there a difference between what we used to do for the maze three, or still can do if you wish with cryo or even cut and sew, and a maze four, which has bipolar radio frequency lesions creating them above and below, and you say, is there any difference between these two electrically or electrophysiologically? The answer is these are the same. There's no difference electrically between these two lesion sets. So for the purposes of treating AFib, particularly paroxysmal AFib, these are the same. Although we'll get to the point that I think these are the same. I think these are pretty good, but I think we can do better. If I were to have a patient with paroxysmal AFib and this is what I did, this is a B, B plus operation. You don't get to be a cardiac surgeon, go through medical school, get a great residency, be a practicing cardiac surgeon, transcript is filled with Bs and B pluses. You want it to be As and A pluses. So this is not bad. This is maybe the minimum for paroxysmal AFib, paroxysmal AFib, but it's not enough. When you look at non-paroxysmal AFib, so now we're talking about anything that's not paroxysmal and lots of different terminologies. Persistent, long stay persistent, permanent. Those are the three currently used. Non-paroxysmal AFib means persistent, long stay persistent, or permanent. Basically, AFib that doesn't come and go on its own, the most common mistake, in my opinion, is omitting the right atrial lesions. If you've got a patient who's in AFib all the time and you decide to skip the right atrial lesions, uh, you're at the BB plus range again. The right atrial lesions are important, particularly in non-paroxysmal AFib. And again, non-paroxysmal, persistent, long stay persistent, permanent, for our purposes though, and as a surgeon, you can just say, is this AFib paroxysmal, meaning it comes and goes all by itself, or is it non-paroxysmal AFib? And if it is non-paroxysmal AFib, there's a fair bit of data to suggest you should add the right atrial lesions. Why? To get a better result. This is an older study from NEVAD, um, but it's a really good study and it's the biggest to date. It had thousands of patients, and they said, what is the difference in success for non-paroxysmal AFib if we add the right atrial lesions? And here is the key figure or curve from that paper. And this is freedom from AFib in green. The freedom from AFib is much better if you have right atrial and left atrial lesions than if you have no right atrial lesions, which is in purple. And again, it's not terrible if you omit the right atrial lesions. In fact, it works more often than it fails, but you're operating on someone, the chest is open, it's a once in a lifetime shot to do the whole thing and to do it well. A common argument against the right atrial lesions is, won't I cause more pacemakers if I add the right atrial lesions? 
don't the right atrial lesions cause pacemakers? The answer is no, not if you do them correctly. The reason behind the benefit of the biatrial lesions in non-paroxysmal AFib relates to the causes of paroxysmal and non-paroxysmal AFib. Paroxysmal AFib is caused by triggers. Basically, when someone pops into AFib, the AFib's got to start somewhere. There's some anatomic focus where that first trigger, which is a premature atrial contraction, or PAC, it's got to be someplace that starts. And the triggers for paroxysmal AFib tend to be in the pulmonary veins and posterior left atrium. Once you've got non-paroxysmal AFib, the triggers aren't doing anything anymore. Once you've got non-paroxysmal AFib, triggers are out of the picture. You've got what are called drivers, which are wide areas or volumes of tissue that are sustaining the AFib. So if you're treating paroxysmal AFib, you're asking the question, how do I address the triggers, the areas where it starts? If you're treating non-paroxysmal AFib, you're asking the question, where are the drivers, these areas of tissue that are sustaining or driving the AFib? So if you look at the drivers, which are represented by all these red arrows, and say, all right, what if I just do pulmonary vein isolation, which gets a lot of the triggers, 60% of the triggers. What if I just do pulmonary vein isolation in non-paroxysmal AFib? You interrupt 60% of the triggers, we already knew that, but you do almost nothing for the drivers. The AFib in non-paroxysmal AFib is sustained by drivers. Pulmonary vein isolation does next to nothing. What if you do a box lesion? Non-paroxysmal AFib to a box lesion, so you box out a lot of area, a lot of volume. That's better. You interrupt a few of the drivers while getting more of the triggers with your box lesion. Now let's say you extend it. You've got a full left-sided maze. You've added at the bottom this line on the coronary sinus right in here. You've taken care of the appendage, and the appendage can be electro electrically active. So you took care of that, got that line. If you do the full left-sided maze, you take care of the left atrial drivers to a large extent, and you get a ton of the triggers. So in non-paroxysmal AFib, doing the left atrial or left-sided maze takes care of the left atrial drivers, but over to your right, you still have the right atrium with its own drivers represented by the red arrows. If you complete the maze procedure, meaning basically add these three right atrial lesions, you get about, nothing's 100%, but close to 100% of the drivers in normal sized atrial. So the biatrial maze from an electrophysiologic perspective makes much more sense in someone with non-paroxysmal AFib and the results are better as well. So it's a nice story that ties together well. Our understanding of AFib suggests a biatrial maze is better in non-paroxysmal AFib and our data on ablation prove that a biotrial maze is better for non-paroxysmal AFib.